just off the extreme southwestern coast of Canada lies the picturesque little city of Victoria, chief seaport of Vancouver Island and the capital of British Columbia, the most westerly of Canada's nine provinces. The history of Vancouver Island goes back to the thrilling days of fur trading, when Russian adventurers crossed the Northern Pacific to Alaska and later made their way down the western coast to Vancouver Island, which had already begun to attract fur traders from most of the seafaring nations, including Spain and England, the chief contenders for ownership. Due largely to the diplomacy of the British captain, George Vancouver, war between England and Spain was averted, and the island which now bears the name of Vancouver became part of the British Empire. Almost from the beginning of its history, therefore, Vancouver Island has been British, and its chief city, named after the late Queen Victoria of England, is said to be the most English city in the dominion of Canada. The Empress Hotel, built and furnished in the baronial style of old England, is the social center of Victoria and one of the finest hotels in North America. The executive headquarters of law and order for all of British Columbia are the Houses of Parliament forming the most imposing buildings in Victoria. As far as distance is concerned, Main Street in Victoria is thousands of miles from the nearest town in England, but in appearance at least, it is not unlike many a street we have seen in the British Isles, including the typical English Bobby, who directs the casual traffic and disdains the modern idea of traffic lights. In the suburbs of Victoria, there are 16 acres of fairyland, better known as Butchert's Gardens, where one may see countless varieties of plant life and splendid examples of old-fashioned gardening, artistically blended with the wildness of nature. have said that Victoria is regarded as the most British city in the dominion of Canada, and we are constantly being reminded of this fact, not only through its architecture and landscapes, but also in the manners and customs of its inhabitants, many of whom are the descendants of the pioneer fur traders, including those who came from Bonnie, Scotland, bringing with them their traditional folk music and dancing to be transplanted upon the virgin soil of their adopted country. Nothing in the great Northwest is more colorful and thrilling to witness than the so-called musical ride of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The total force of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police today does not exceed 1,300 officers and men. Yet in the fulfillment of their duties, they efficiently police thousands of miles of territory, extending northwestward from the boundary line of the United States through the Canadian Rockies to the polar regions. It is said that criminals fear these guardians of the peace more than they fear any other arm of the law in North America for they know that no matter how far north they may travel or where they may hide in the vastness of the Canadian Rockies, they will sooner or later be captured by the dreaded Mounties who always get their man. It is doubtful that the development of the great Northwest 
would have been possible had it not been for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who protected the railroad builders and pioneer settlers from the onslaughts of warring Indians, and later protected the Indians themselves from the illegal exploitation of renegade white men. About 40 miles from Victoria on the mainland of Western Canada lies the city of Vancouver, the largest in British Columbia, with a population of about 350,000 inhabitants. It has one of the finest harbors in the world, forming a natural port of egress for Canada's rapidly developing trade with the Orient, Australia, Latin America, and the islands of the South Seas. It is also the terminus of numerous rail and steamship lines flying between the United States and Canada. Vancouver is one of the great cities of the Northwest that owes much of its development and prosperity to the lumber industry. About 70 years ago, shortly after the establishment of Vancouver, a great fire swept the whole town to destruction, and out of the ashes there arose a new city built of brick and stone, financed principally by the proceeds of lumber sold to the outside market. By a strange twist of fate, therefore, Vancouver, the great lumber port of the Northwest, has fewer wooden buildings than any other city of its size in the Dominion of Canada. The shopping districts are comparable to those of the world's metropolitan cities, and there is to be found here, among commodities of local manufacture, the choice merchandise of the British Isles. In the residential sections of the city, we find a substantial array of colorful homes, designed and laid out in a style that is typical of Vancouver. Situated in the center of Vancouver is Stanley Park with a total area of a thousand acres encircled by a seven-mile motor drive, which affords one the opportunity of viewing an ever-changing panorama of forest and garden scenes. On July 26, 1923, the late Warren G. Harding addressed a tremendous gathering in Stanley Park. And insofar as he was the first president of the United States to visit Canada, a monument has been erected on the spot where he spoke, and it commemorates the spirit of friendship and goodwill that exists between Canada and the United States, two great neighbors who have learned how to live in peace with each other. And it is with this thought that we say farewell to Victoria and Vancouver, gateways to Canada.